Anoma has native generalized intents, which none, no existing system right now has, or has any clue how to get. Intents are clearly the next level of abstraction because most users don't actually know which counterparty they want to interact with. For a privacy preserving system to work, you need intents. And why is that? Well, privacy preserving systems necessarily push data to edge devices, right? Like now your state lives on your phone rather than into, in the big database in the middle where everyone can see it. And with intents, you can make statements and sort of updates over your local state. And then you can have solvers that aggregate and sort of compute over this. Certainly right now, like Coinbase and Kraken and Binance are the single largest mixers in the world. Hello and welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Crane and today I'm speaking with Adrian Brink. He is the co-founder of Anoma. And uh, yeah, before we talk with Adrian, we just want to share a few words for more sponsors this week. If you're looking to stake your crypto with confidence, look no further than Course 1. More than 150,000 delegators, including institutions like BitGo, Pantera Capital, and Ledger, trust Chorus One with their assets. They support over 50 blockchains and are leaders in governance on networks like Cosmos, ensuring your stake is responsibly managed. Thanks to their advanced MEV research, you can also enjoy the highest staking rewards. You can stake directly from your preferred wallet, set up a white label node, restake your assets on Eigenlayer or Symbiotic, or use their SDK for multi chain staking in your app. Learn more at chorus.one and start staking today. This episode is proudly brought to you by Gnosis, a collective dedicated to advancing a decentralized future. Gnosis leads innovation with Circles, Gnosis Pay, and Metri, reshaping open banking and money. With Hashi and Gnosis VPN, they're building a more resilient, privacy-focused internet. If you're looking for an L1 to launch your project, Gnosis Chain offers the same development environment as Ethereum with lower transaction fees. It's supported by over 200,000 validators, making Gnosis Chain a reliable and credibly neutral foundation for your applications. Gnosis DAO drives Gnosis governance where every voice matters. Join the Gnosis community in the Gnosis DAO forum today. Deploy on the EVM compatible Gnosis Chain or secure the network with just one GNO and affordable hardware. Start your decentralization journey today at Gnosis.io. Cool. Thanks so much for uh, for coming on, Adrian. I know you were, I mean, I've, we've known each other since 2017, I guess, when we were both working at Tenement, sort of at the beginning of the Cosmos ecosystem. And, and Those of course- Those are wild times. Yes. <laughs> where you have learned the right way to build a crypto project. <laughs> and then you took all these learnings, right? And then uh, some years later, you started the project Enoma together with Chris Goes, right? Um, and Ava, right? Chris Goes, who is also uh, one of the key engineers at, uh, at Cosmos, I think implemented a lot of IBC. So what, what, what was the vision for you guys? Like what, what is Enoma? Yeah. Uh I can quickly, I mean, the Cosmos days were interesting. Um, so I joined like January 2017, just around the time of the fundraiser. Um, we were like seven people, I think, with like Bucky and uh, Ethan Fry and Rigel back in the day. And I mean, I think Cosmos got a lot of things wrong, but also got a lot of things right to some extent. Like it was actually very innovative. Um, and it actually cared deeply about decentralization, right? And so like, and by the way, I think we, People don't give enough credit to Chris here. Uh, I think the only reason why IBC works and shipped is because Chris like spent a year and a half of his life on making sure that actually worked in the end. Um, like without Chris, I think we would all be one interoperability standard poor right now. Um, no, but so the vision behind Anoma was always how do we get a unified developer experience? Because so like historically we looked at this and like so me, our and Chris, we built a couple of uh, so we built the validator, Cryptium Labs, one of their very first proof of stake validators started around the same time as Chorus 1, um, scaled that up to a ton of assets in retrospect, um, and then very gladly sold it to you guys because we very quickly realized that like validation is fun for like six months and I like wrecking servers for six months, but afterwards it was like, yeah, 
I like protocol engineering and research much more than I like physical infrastructure. Um, and so like around the middle of 2020, our Chris and I sat down and was like, okay, what, what is, where's this space going? Um, and everyone seemed to be sort of copy and pasting the three same con the uh, same three contracts to yet another chain or yet named them another name. And somehow this was supposed to be progress on like actually building the future that we kind of envisioned on like a heterogeneous trust world. Everyone has, like, everyone uses blockchains all the time. Blockchains become this coordination substrate, not only for financial transactions, but for sort of societies as a whole, right? And honestly, no one was really working on this in the middle of 2020. And it, it felt very depressing at the time, I have to say, that like everyone had abandoned sort of the idea of we should be building fundamental infrastructure that actually makes people's life better. And instead, we're like, well, let's copy these like three solidity contracts to yet another chain. And somehow this is going to make progress, right? Um, and the th I mean, to some extent, we still have this nowadays, but I'm like, everyone is very much focused on this incremental innovation. Like some people are trying to make a slightly faster consensus. Some people are trying to make a slightly different proof system. Um, but to Cosmos's and also like to Cosmos's credit, actually at the time, it's like it proposed a new model. I'm like, we weren't going to live in a single chain world. We were going to live in this multi-chain world. And so with Anoma, this is kind of thinking that through to the end, which is, A, you need privacy guarantees. Uh, I thought, like, we figured that this was going to be very fundamental. Um, if you didn't have a base layer platform that enabled developers and users to obtain privacy guarantees, where you always had to bolt on the privacy guarantees after the fact that this was never going to work. And I think this is still holding true today. Um, this is why I think sort of this is very challenging for existing ecosystems to really get mass market traction because fundamentally, like my parents will not want to use them, right? And like for DJ and casino gambling, this is fine. But even if you're a liquid hedge fund, like you need privacy guarantees so that you don't leak your strategies to everyone else. Um, the other aspect was you needed a, I think we always held the view that the world was going to be heterogeneous trust. It seemed, or it, it, I mean, it's very unlikely, I think, that there's going to be a single chain to rule them all. And I sometimes like to do this experiment where I like ask people, I was like, do you like a one world government? And pretty much no one likes that idea. Um, and yet we are designing for these models right now where like we have a single security model to rule them all. And so our fundamental thesis was at the time, even that like the world is going to be heterogeneous trust, but you want to have a unified sort of abstraction that developers and users can work against. Uh, so that you don't have to rewrite your applications all the time. And I mean, we're seeing this right now where if you go from Ethereum to Solana as a developer, this is a completely different system. Um, like you move trust models, but it's a completely separate developer environment that you now have to, like development environment that you have to deal with. Um, and that sort of led to the third component, which is this unified operating system abstraction. Where it's like you want to have a unified AP like operating system API that developers and users can rely on that can work in many heterogeneous trust models where ideally even heterogeneous trust models can interoperate with each other uh, sort of like as the trust boundaries as the consensus systems allow. And so like the super simple example is it always struck me as super unlikely that like USDC would be issued globally on Ethereum um, because and like we see it's it just a weird model where it's like no national government is going to give up, or like uh, USD, not USDC, no national government, like the Swiss government is never going to give up its monetary sovereignty to like some Ethereum validate, I said. Like they will always want their own sovereign system that can issue their own money. And right, so like we, end, we need to end up in this world where we have many of these heterogeneous systems, but while still allowing that assets and developers and applications can flow between them. So that as a user, I can just say, well, I have some state on like system A, I call this the Swiss, Switzerland system, and now I'd like to use the exactly the same application, but I'd like to like do some settlement on, um, I don't know, on global Ethereum. And so Anoma was always designed around this. How do we get heterogeneous trust plus privacy? Um, and then the last part, which I think most people know Anoma for, which is Intense, which is really something that like, to a large extent, we came up with the idea of Intense, or Chris came up with the idea of Intense in 2016, I think, when he built the Wyvern Dex protocol, which is the backend to open C prior to C port. Still to this day, the single largest gas user on Ethereum, uh, which is this Proton 10 system, it was the insight that really most users don't have transactions. They have intents. They have like a partial state transition. Uh, they don't have 
uh, I would like to like just send you my Bitcoin to you. I mean, this exists in the Bitcoin case, but like anything complex doesn't have this. So it's like, I would like to trade A for B. I don't know with, with, a, with one counterparty, with 15 counterparties. Um, and so this is really what the, where the intent angle comes from. And so as a whole, taken together, you get this. Um, it, I know really is a decentralized operating system um, for privacy preserving, like for applications. Like think of it this way. It's a unified operating system abstraction that allows developers to write applications and users to use those applications irrespective in which specific trust model or heterogeneous trust model they run. Um, that's okay. maybe a super quick, not quick, but an intro. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things here that, you know, I think will be, uh, take some time to unpack. I um, just want to maybe on the last thing. So you said that de decentralized op or an operating system for decentralized applications. I mean, I've been very involved in, uh, as I'm very curious about this phrase operating system in this context. Uh, I mean, I know, for example, I've been very involved in Urbit, right? Which has this idea of like an operating system. Uh, I guess this has maybe been used in some other ways in crypto as well. Like this term operating system. I'm curious, like what, when you say operating system, what does that mean? Yeah, so it comes from the specific analogy to traditional computers. Where really like the way you can currently think of something like the EVM or the SVM is as a specific CPU. Think of this as an Intel CPU and an ARM CPU. Right, and so at the moment we're all living in this world where we program directly against the CPUs, um, and the operating system analogy comes from the fact that a normalized operating system can really abstract away the differences in underlying CPU, so an underlying virtual machine, which means it's like a normalized is not designed to replace the SVM or the EVM. I mean, it's like a normalized an intent machine. The intent machine sort of sits on top of existing virtual machines. And just allows develop so that developers can build applications against the operating system APIs. And I mean, this was sort of the fundamental unlock with Windows to some extent in the past, where all of a sudden I could start building applications against Windows, and I didn't have to care which specific um, CPU that that Windows operating system was running on. And the other thing is, the operating system analogy works also quite well because the operating system like Windows gave you a bunch of system level APIs. Um, for example, like distributed systems. So like in Anoma, you can just, you can like talk to the operating system of Anoma um, in terms of like figuring out how to like route in the heterogeneous trust world. Um, so it's not just you operate on a single CP on a single operating system, you, you, uh, it gives you the APIs to operate on sort of a networked set of operating systems, if that makes sense. Okay. I mean, before you were talking about, right, when you sort of introduced Anoma, you mentioned some things like, okay, Pri you, you think privacy is important, you think then there will be like, you know, kind of like different chains or different environments with different trust assumptions that you want to have this unified API and the intents. Now, I, I think these are more like, you're not really a description of like, what is a Noma, maybe more some things on like views you have about how, you know, how w what is important and what should something look like. But then is like, is a Noma... Is it like a chain uh, and it also a framework for developing blockchains and the, or like, how would you? Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting question. What is Anoma? What is Anoma? <laughs> Anoma is probably the single most sort of modular and composable stack you can have. I mean, you can use Anoma to build your own blockchain. I mean, I'd be very happy with the Swiss government at some point adopts Anoma to like run their own sovereign Switzerland chain to issue uh, the digital CHF. Um, you can also, Anoma is also, you can deploy Anoma, the operating system, directly to Ethereum. So Anoma can run on Ethereum. Um, and then, sort of like now you have all these instances, and there may also be a global Anoma chain, right? There's going to be most likely a global Anoma chain, um, which is separate from the protocols. Like it's not directly tied to each other. Like, there's Anoma, the protocol specification, and then Anoma, so the like instantiation. The Cosmos SDK in the Cosmos Hub. Kind of similar, actually. Uh, I was thinking about this earlier today as well. It's like, and I think, honestly, Cosmos is actually a good example of like the model really worked, like of like this general framework to build many different things. The other thing that also is Anoma is the fact that all these systems have a common P2P stack. Um, so like, if you have a Noma on Ethereum and you have global Noma, um, 
as a user, you interact with the unified P2P stack. Like you, in code, you specify, and like in your application, in your intent, you specify whether you would like to be settled on global Ethereum or global unknown. This is not like you have to modify to like point to a different RPC endpoint. Um, there's just one unified P2P stack. Um, there's not many separate so that's P2P that's basically networks. like, okay, I'm somebody developing an application and then, you know, I sort of like create transaction and then that's sort of unified regardless of where it goes. I mean, because then in, yeah. Yes. You as a developer, as a user, effectively get a unified API here where you describe in code rather than sort of like in physical infrastructure where you, where you want your state to live, right? And I think, so the important, because the important thing is you need to figure out as a user, as a developer, where do you want your state to live? I mean, this is actually, this is the hard question. State is fundamentally the hard question in these systems. It is not about sort of like specific execution environments or ZK proofs. It's like who controls which part of state? Um, and so with intents, you can specify like, I would like the state to live on Ethereum. I would like to use Ethereum, for example, as my ordering machine. So in that case, the ordering is done um, by the Ethereum validators. Or you say, you know, I would like my ordering of my intense transactions to be done by like Brian, and I would like my state to then be settled to Ethereum. So you get all this flexibility along the stack without having to all the time like cherry pick like and like monkey patch your own components together. Um, like Anoma is a lot of things because it tries to sort of make application development and usage of these systems an order of magnitude easier. Uh, I mean, I know I was saying this in the beginning here on the innovation part, right? Like, I think everyone else is but like... It sounds much more confusing. I mean, like if, if you go to a, right, if you go to someone who's like, hey, I just want to build some kind of decentralized app, right? And be like, oh, I can build it on like Solana. Easy to understand, right? Even I gonna build my own Cosmos chain, pretty easy, you know, maybe slightly more hard, but still pretty easy to understand. But now this kind of thing of I can, you know, shard it up, have some part here, there, execution. I mean, I, I would just be confused. Let me say, you can, I'm explaining the complex path. You can just have the simple path. If you just want to deploy your application to Ethereum using Anoma and get all the privacy guarantees, for example, and the intent, like generalized intents, you can just do this, deploy the, like you write an application in Jubix, you click deploy to Ethereum, it's deployed to Ethereum. Now you have a decentralized application on Ethereum. So, so okay, so, but decentralized application on Ethereum, w w what does that mean? I mean, because the transactions don't happen on Ethereum, I presume. So these are like normal Ethereum transactions then. This looks much more like a uh, plasma construction where specifically how this works is you have a settlement contract on Ethereum. You have the Anoma resource machine implementation on Ethereum. And then you have users that want to send intents. They send those intents. For example, you have a simple order book exchange uh, with privacy guarantees, which is something that you can't currently build in any existing system. Uh, users send these intents to the Anoma P2P stack. Solvers pick them up. Solvers compose them together if there's an overlap then this transaction gets settled to Ethereum. That's sort of the simple case here um, where, so yeah, th this is actually very important to understand because people keep asking you this all the time. There's no specific Anoma chain that you must send your thing to. Like everyone else is presenting these like abstractive frameworks that all effect essentially boil down to let, like for example, the chain abstraction folks are kind of like this. And it's like, oh, let's just build this out yet another chain to like, solve our, all our abstraction problems and then users only need to interact with one chain that then orders and sequences everything and then sort of we reach out from there. Anoma's taking the very different approach on like users, like there's no Anoma chain and users can directly use the operating system to wherever they want to use it. Um, so in the case of Ethereum, this be really just an Ethereum contract, um, some state that you deploy to the Anoma resource machine on Ethereum, that state now lives on Ethereum you send your transactions on a P2P stack, um, and then those get settled to Ethereum. And so you guys, like, I presume one of your areas, or one of your goals is to get people to build decentralized applications on, you know, the Anoma stack. 
Yes, broadly speaking, um, build against the normal resource machine. This is how it's described. Build against the operating system. Um, honestly, where a user specifically wants to run the operating system, um, that is going to be up to them. But I mean, I'm not a developer, right? I'm not, I mean, I'm not quite your target audience, but you know, I've sort of been in crypto for a while as a, as a, someone who, you know, can try to put myself into the shoes of someone wanting to build some, some decentralized application. I'm, I'm a bit confused because when you say build against the Enoma resource machine, I'm, I have like no idea what that means or why somebody would want to do it. Maybe to make it very simple. Imagine you build an application against the normal resource machine, and then you... Well, what does that mean? Uh, it's, I mean, you build against, when you build an application against the EVM, right? You build against a specific instruction set, against a specific state model, um, against... You mean specific, Solidity. Or Viper, right? Like, there are many things that target the yeah, underlying... right. So, like, think of it, you build against some system calls. Like, you build an application, um, and then at runtime, you decide, well, today I like the Ethereum folks better, so you you deploy to Ethereum. And tomorrow you decide, well, turns out they didn't like the thing I had, and then you just deploy to Solana. And you don't have to rewrite your application. This is sort of like the fundamental point. Or you deploy this to your local community chain if that ever gets set up, and you don't have to rewrite your application. So as a developer, it's honestly just like a lot easier because... It's kind of like, I guess in the past, people argued, well, we should all be building against Intel CPUs. And then Windows came along and people started building against Windows. And all of a sudden, developers realized, holy crap, it's way easier to build against Windows because now I can run my application wherever Windows runs. Okay, but I, so I, I get that that's in it. I, I get that there's some value in that. Uh, but that seems to be something that's actually pretty well covered by the EVM, no? Because, I mean, in the end, we have now seen, right, you have, like, EVM Ethereum, you have EVM Rollups, you have Cosmo, EVM on Cosmos, EVM on Avalanche, EVMs everywhere, right? So, like, that kind of thing of, like, oh, I build my application in Solidity, and, you know, I have a lot of benefits because, whatever, it's, like, very popular, and I can deploy it somewhere else. Uh, cause if you guys building like a completely new stack, then well, you actually, I mean, I get that maybe it is a stack that, yeah, in principle it can be used in many different places. So if it gets adoption, then maybe you, you would have a similar kind of benefit that people have today in Bennett in building the on thing, top which, of solidity, which we really shouldn't underestimate. Anoma has native generalized intents, which none, no existing system right now has or has any clue how to get. Um, and it has... Uh, Why is that full... valuable? Because fundamentally, like, your application, if you build them directly against the EVM or the SVM, for example, I mean, they, those applications fundamentally rely on transactions. So you need to build a bunch of extra moving pieces in order to actually model the domain that, you're, that your users are going to have. Because most users don't have transactions anymore. They have, like, I would like to trade A for B, and I actually don't care against who. Like, this is not a transaction you can build. Uh, because, I mean, like you have sort of the poor man's version of this, which is an AMM, but an AMM only works for assets. It doesn't work for um, NFTs, for example. So like just you want generalized intents, I think, as a long term goal here and even a short term goal um, because so generalized intents like the, the, the so I get I mean, right. So if, if we talk about intents, right, so uh, I, I guess the simple example of intent would be something like like a limit order, you know. Uh, where I'm like, hey, I am willing to, you know, sell whatever E for one E for USDC, and you know, give me the best price, and I'm pay willing up to pay up to this, something like that, and then I so in the AMM case, it's pretty clear, but like, so the argument is here that. It makes it easier for an application developer to allow people to sort of, you know, more more express uh, a, a desire about the end state they want to get to, as opposed to, you know, a specific transaction. Yes, and that that's valuable for or important for a lot of use cases, and and so you, for example, get like nice benefits such as you get compose composable liquidity. Uh, currently, you have to make specific choices on do you interact with this AMM or that AMM, I mean, there's like some aggregation that can happen as well, but 
genuine with gen license intent, you can have the thing like, well, I'd like to sell like one NFT again, like two green crypto kitties against some ETH. And maybe there's no direct match because the person that sort of wants to buy the two green, green crypto kitties only wants to take USDC, right? And so you can do these multi-party compose, like multi-intent composing. Uh, I think that's one very huge benefit. The other benefit is, as a user, you can also say things like, "I would like to trade A for B," and I actually don't care whether it's settled on Optimism, Arbitrum, or Ethereum. Just give me whatever is quickest or fastest. Uh, this is something that you just can't express right now. Um, this is sort of uh, where the heterogeneous trust component or heterogeneous trust model component comes in. Um, you can really think of this as defragmenting a lot of the state, but even just in a single sort of like state model and like a single chain world, we can compose, like intents can just compose across every, like however many cases you want to have, um, which means for example, even for like simple things like limit orders, you aren't limited to settle them against an AMM. You can say, well, I'd like to do A for B and maybe it's an AMM or maybe it's Brian or maybe it's only these five people on a whitelist or maybe it's not anyone on this blacklist or it's just 50 people um, that I've never met and that I never coordinated with, right? Like you have this full flexibility, which is just going to give you deeper liquidity, if I'm honest, um, because intents can match against all of it. And I think this is sort of the fundamental thing where it's like intents are clearly the next level of abstraction because most users don't actually know which counterparty they want to interact with. Like, like when we came up with the sort of transaction-centric model in the Bitcoin world, it was always, well, I'll go to a store and I'll buy some milk and then I'll send some Bitcoin to the store. Um, but it turns out that the reality of the applications we end up building is mostly around like, um, like internet-based coordination. It's like, I have A for B, who, who wants to do the other side of the thing? And I don't really want to have to figure out how to do manual counterpart discovery, right? And I think this is this is why you also see that everyone is starting to think and move towards intents. And like, this was actually very validating because like when we started Noma in the end of, uh, beginning of 2021, people thought we were nuts. Like we kept talking about these intents and like why intents were going to matter. And now everyone is like, oh, we should like start thinking about intents. And like most of the DeFi applications are starting to like think on how to move towards intents. And I mean, everyone is starting to like move to like application specific intents. Um, but Anoma is the only generalized intents framework out there where you just get generalized intents. And like, you don't have to build the stack yourself anymore. You don't have to hand roll a bunch of infra. You can just go, here are intents. Let me build my application. And I get like all this like very annoying networking code to like do kind of high discovery for free. Right, right. So basic, I mean, I kind of, get that argument where you say like, okay, there are like applications, right? So basically DeFi applications or similar types of application. I mean, probably all DeFi and trading related realistically where, you know, this is relevant. And, and I guess often is this also often around trying to minimize MEV maybe. This is the other huge component of intense. It's, and by the way, this is not just DeFi. I can give you an example in a sec on like where this, where you have intents as a non-DeFi example. But so we, I think three years ago or four years ago, made a mistake where we went like, instead of trying to actually come up with a technical solution to this pro arising problem of MEV, we sort of like engineered it and called it a, a feature, not a bug. Um, intents at the base layer mostly solve this because all of a sudden you can say, well, I have the specific state transition. And like you have to sign over, like I'm willing to trade one ETH against I don't know, uh, two thousand uh, USDC, um, and this can be ordered in whatever sort of like it can be included in a block in whatever order you want because you signed over a specific thing. Like one of the big problems with transactions is that transactions um, don't specify state outcomes; they just specify like compute steps. So you end up like you have some starting state. Then you apply some ran some like compute, and then you get into some resulting state outcomes. Well, now depending on how you interleave these compute computational traces, you get to different state outcomes. And intents mostly solve this because in intents you just specify specific state outcomes, and it doesn't matter how you interleave them. Um, and the other interesting example of an intent-centric system 
is actually two. One is Gnosis safe. Um, most people don't realize this, but like if you have a partial multisig, like we're in a one out of two, like two out of two multisig, and we're using Gnosis safe, what actually happens is I create my partial signature, it gets sent to the central server. Um, you then create your partial signature, pull my partial signature from the central server, then submit both together. I mean, this is a prototypical example of an intent-centric system. Um, where right now we're relying on very centralized infrastructure. In a normal with generalized intents, you don't have to rely on the centralized service anymore. The other really good example is rollups. Um, I mean, when you think of what a rollup does, it's you have a user that has an individual state transition and then many users, and then the rollup does some compute to collapse all these things together. Well, honestly, that's just a number of intents that you collapse into one to settle then as a state transition function on some underlying base layer. Um, so, like for example, with Anoma, you just get rollups of free to some extent. You don't have to build all your own components for your own rollups. It just happens to fall out of this generalized infrastructure that intends are just a better abstraction to also represent things like rollups. And maybe then the last thing, because people really forget about this when they think about privacy, is one of the big things. Well, everyone wants privacy preserving systems, and sort of my fundamental thesis is, or like, and this is just true that like. For privacy-preserving system to work, you need intents. And why is that? Well, privacy-preserving systems necessarily push data to edge devices, right? Like now your state lives on your phone rather than into in the big database in the middle where everyone can see it. And with intents, you can make statements and sort of updates over your local state, send them to someone else, and then have sort of the other person um, or like have many of those intents flow into the center of the network and then you can have solvers that aggregate and sort of compute over this. Um, whereas right now, we just all compute over this like global known state. In a privacy-preserving world, you're going to need intents because a state just lives on edge devices at that point, and you need to be able to make statements over like local state that doesn't live in the middle. Right, you're not trying to replace you know, EVM or SVM or something like that. So basically, it means... I as a, so let's say I'm building some application on Solana and I'm using the SVM, then I would use sort of like Enoma as almost as like layer in between. Um, this really depends on where you are in your stack. Um, I mean, if you already have an existing application running on the EVM, for example, on Ethereum, um, you may just want to move tiny parts of your state of your application to Enoma. That just means you rebuild this against your normal resource machine. Um, but the important thing is you don't have to move all your state at once. Like it, I think one of the reasons that I was always very skeptical on sort of just yet another L1 or yet another L2 was always like you had to force all this valuable state to move to this new L2 or this new L1, right? Like you had this like massive bootstrapping problem. And so with Anoma, sort of the architecture, the operating system comes to where the valuable state already lives. And so then over time, as you might want to migrate more and more of your application to Anoa, you can do this over time, but users don't have to actually like move their assets from Solana, from Ethereum to yet another L1. They can just move within the system into sort of the normal operating system, operating the normal protocol adapter on Solana, on Ethereum. Now you mentioned you guys are creating another L1. What does the Anoma chain do? Very fundamentally, I mean, Anoma, the L1, is really designed as a... It's a global consensus mechanism, but they can also de be deployed into local instances. So you want to have some Anoma native consensus, effectively, that can really leverage the operating system to its fullest. Um, like, maybe one good analogy you can think of is it's a hyper-optimized CPU implementation for Anoma, the operating system. Um, generally speaking, most functionality of the operating system should be available on most other virtual machines um, on the Anoma on the Anoma chain is just going to be more optimized. Uh, the other thing is there is a so it's the obvious place. Sorry, I I totally did not understand this at all. Like so, basically, Anoma L one would be like a chain that I like me I as an application developer if I want to build like an app. I can now say, hey, I go to Solana or I create a Cosmos chain or I build on this Anoma L1. Is that what? Uh, yes. 
uh, in, in the end, it's going to come down to whether users, like which chain users want to like have their state live on. I, I think currently we live in this no, like very- users do not care. Like, I mean, users like- they, If they you ask care. any user the question of like, where do you want your state to live on? They will just be confused. Yes, but eventually users will need to care for simple latency reasons. Uh, I mean, like one of the very fundamental things is like, a normal will always be faster. Like local and normal will always be faster than Solana, um, because it's like it's just like Solana is limited by speed of light, and like it has to run like two consensus rounds on a, over the global fiber network. Um, if the two of us want to trade and we're in the same room, we should do this on a local system. Um, there's just like no way around this. Um, like, and the local system will always just be faster, right? Um, I agree that right now users may not fundamentally um, care as much, but I think it's also mostly because our in, like our industry has kind of designed a bunch of infrastructure that's very targeted towards casino use cases. Uh, whether this is like going to survive long term is very questionable to me. Um, and for example, I mean, like the other interesting thing to consider here is, um, I, I think if you'd ask people, I don't know, four years ago, whether multi-chain was going to be a thing, everyone would have said no. I like people were at least very skeptical about this. Um, it, it's very clear that the multi-chain world played out um, between like all the L2 chains as well as all the L1 chains. I mean, the world is clearly going to be multi-chain. Um, so users clearly have preferences on which chain they're on and like where their state lives. Users care. I, I don't know about that conclusion. I mean, you could, I think it's like primarily the application developers know who make that, those decisions. I mean, obviously users care about things like, I want like faster transactions, right? Or I want cheaper fees. And then of course that may mean, okay, they now like, uh, arbitrary more than Sol uh, than uh, ETH L1 because it's cheaper. But like, I mean, no one's going to be, oh, I'd rather use, I mean, very, very few people are going to be like, oh, I'd rather use Arbitrum than I think optimism. Like, who, who does that? I don't know. I mean, I certainly do. Um, <laughs> because I, like, because fundamentally effective security model and your latency model. I mean, this is just like something that you shouldn't underestimate. And I am, I think if users really like long-term don't care, honestly, the best answer to like how to build a hyper-optimized system is like, we should do Definity and just live in a bunch of like centralized data centers because users don't care where the state lives, right? And so like, I mean, this is, I mean, if users don't care where the state lives, I think it's a very strong argument that users don't care about decentralization. And I think with Anoma, we've always taken the um, approach that decentralization actually matters because otherwise we're just building very slow, expensive databases here. And yeah, if, if decentralization doesn't matter in the end, I have questions on like what our industry has been doing in the last couple of years. But my point to this is like, I think decentralization really fundamentally matters because users care about this privacy, uh, their security model. Why does decentralization matter? As a whole, why does decentralization matter? Yeah. I, I, I think this comes really down to if decentralization doesn't matter, We've spent a couple, like 10 years building probably the single slowest database implementations that for some reason keep like multiplying all the state across hundreds and thousands of nodes across the globe for no particular reason. Like if decentralization doesn't matter, we should just all be running on a single server run by, I don't know, like, I, I guess but base. Like let's say, like what, what are some things that to me feel like important, right? So one is that people anywhere in the world can just use these blockchain networks, right? That's like open access. I think that's like, and then some kind of censorship resistance, you know, people can like transact in whatever way they want and the transaction doesn't get censored. And then if you, if you don't know, have decentralization, you don't have any of those properties. Maybe, maybe not, right? But still it's not, they're not an end in of itself, but it's like a means to an end. Yes, I agree with that. Uh, sorry. I mean, I, I think, we want censorship resistance. We want, I mean, we want World War Three resilience to some extent. 
Like we want the ability to have many separate systems that can fail independently of each other. Uh, we want to have privacy guarantees at these base layers. And I think so of decentralization is an easy way to describe all of these things, because if we don't have decentralization, we're not going to have any of these. And for example, actually, this is an interesting point on like, what do we want from these systems? Like what I personally think is actually a very important feature of them is like on the eve of World War Three kind of thing, um, global fiber will go down. And so like you can't rely on these global consensus systems to remain up. And so like I know it's also designed around this failure case on like if you don't have global connectivity anymore, you're not going to run Bitcoin or Ethereum or Solana. That's going to hold almost immediately. Um, and so you want to have infrastructure that people can use locally to coordinate locally. And this is really like what I think of as World War III resilience of actual decentralization. It's not about like having a single global decentralized system. It's about having many systems independently of each other that sort of like when the happy path exists can coordinate and like interoperate with each other. But when the sort of unhappy path comes to be, um, the local infrastructure still works. Um, and I, I always use the example of Switzerland. It's like the Swiss financial system will collapse immediately as soon as like North Atlantic fiber goes, goes down. Like that, that none of these systems are set up in a way in which like it can handle like global network outages. And a normal is always designed as like, as a, almost like a drop and replacement for local coordination infrastructure so that there's a coordination substrate that people can run locally. Then as um, sort of connectivity recovers again, you can coordinate with people further away. But then like, for example, the Enormant L1 is going to be a proof of stake chain, no? With like something like Tendermint like consensus or something similar? It's heterogeneous Paxos plus heterogeneous Nawal. Um, I mean, so realistically speaking, we are all children of Tendermint at this point. Um, like Ethereum consensus, Polkadot consensus, um, even Solana looks a lot like PBFT. Aptos Suite, definitely PBFT. So we're all descendants of Tenement at this point. But there's some kind of... Because that, again, will be a system, right, where you're going to have validator across the world. There's going to be token staked with the validators. Uh, and they are communicating with each other, right? They're sending blocks around. They're saying, okay, this block is valid. This block is fine. So that system, if you now have, okay, no more fiber, because World War Three. Any global consensus system is going to have tremendous problems um, in sort of a globally global world of three scenario, including Bitcoin. This is just going to be, I think, like I think people really over well, Bitcoin with like Starlink and stuff should probably be pretty pretty okay. No, the satellites are the first things to go. Um, like there's no you mean because they're shut down. Yes, or how how are they? Uh, or because bandwidth is going to be heavily uh, restricted to military use cases. Uh, I mean, like, I, I just don't see a world in which, like, we enter global co a bunch of centralized global conflict and we go, like, ah, but the meme coins must keep going uh, glo on global consensus. Um, like, I mean, I hold a pessimistic view. Hopefully I'm wrong, I have to say. Uh, but, I mean, actually, so, Bitcoin, if slow block times may actually be helpful here. Because you have very little, slow, for sure, slow you block have very, definitely very yeah, yeah. little bandwidth requirements for global consensus. Uh, but like something, I think Bitcoin like, will be fine. Bitcoin may be fine. Um, if I had my vote for Bitcoin, we should slow down blocks to like an hour. Um, then we definitely be fine. I think. I mean, it, it, well, it could may well have some kind of issues, right? Like, let's say Bitcoin would be. Because some of the hash rates cut off and now all of a sudden, basically the hash rate like temporarily goes from like, you know, 100% to 20%. And now a block time goes up to like an hour or two hours every block and, and then slowly gets long on well, again. And then we may have a like problem that. that like, so if global stabilization time is ever more than 10 minutes, Bitcoin just never converges. This is sort of just a, like the fundamental liveness versus safety trade-off that most of these systems have made. Uh, like Tenement made the other choice, right? Tenement will stop, will halt block production. But for example, if it takes on average 11 minutes to gossip a Bitcoin block around the net, the globe, uh, there will always just be multiple chains that converge from each other uh, because no one sees sort of like their next tip prior to them having mined their own chain. No, I don't think that's true. This It's a fundamental 
property of distributed systems. I mean, this is like this is why Tenement was so controversial at the time because Tenement took the opposite approach, which is Tenement decided to halt rather than um, sort of like fork. I can find, I have a talk about this from like 2017, I think. But anyway, it seems a bit, it's a little uh, different very, topic. This is very much out there and we've kind of like lost yeah, yeah. the track here, but... Uh, Although important to think about. Yeah. So, so I mean, like my entire <laughs> thing is like, outside of like specific infrastructure, like we should be thinking on how to design, like we should be designing protocols that can actually be resilient. As in like, and like you want to think about the worst case scenario. And so you want to have systems that um, A, are hard to capture sort of politically, and B, that can interoperate with each other quite easily so that we don't have sort of like these, because even a single decentralized network is still very centralized. It's a single failure point. I'd much rather have like a thousand decentralized systems, but it's super easy for users to switch between any 500 of them, um, because that means that no individual system gets a tremendous amount of power. And like an almost fundamentally designed around this goal. I mean, well, one of the things I do really like about Enoma, and, and you know, I, I think I remember having some, maybe some podcasts, some discussions in the last years, you know, I was like asked about like, okay, how do we feel about crypto? What what are some things that, you know, concern me? And probably the biggest thing is the privacy thing, right? Where like in the beginning, we were always like, oh, you know, it, there was even an assumption, right, in Bitcoin of, Hey, it's private, right? Because, you know, you have a different... Ad. Now, of course, very quickly, it was like, again, yeah, not that private, actually. But then with time, I think what we've had is, of course, you know, services like Chainalysis, you know, where they're really good at de-anonymizing transactions, linking them together. And then I think the other thing we've had is that it changes... That, oh, obviously, regulators, they don't seem to like privacy because they want to control and they want to have transparent data and so the privacy coins that they that do exist and the privacy projects that do exist seem to have a hard time getting listed on exchanges and of course if you don't get listed on exchanges no trading no money it's very hard to go anywhere so i do really appreciate that you guys have always been uh kind of strong uh, proponents of privacy and of the importance of it but what does that look like? Do you, are you also like you worried about like, for example, exchange list things for like Anoma and the super nice thing about so Anoma is not a privacy coin or privacy chain. It just happens to have the facilities for developers to build um, privacy preserving applications. And interesting enough, it's not even developers necessarily deciding whether something is privacy preserving. Right, like on Ethereum or on Solana, you have to make this choice on like. Do I write it, like, is my app, entire application privacy preserving or not? In Anoma, it's much more of a user choice. It's like, does user A want to interact with the system, with this application privately or not? It is not a system level choice. Um, Anoma can be fully used as a fully transparent system. If no one ever cares about this, they don't have to worry about it. Um, but if individual users care, they can make a choice on like, well, instead of attaching a plain text signature, I attach a zero knowledge proof. Um, and I, I think sort of like the industry has largely failed at making this like relatively nuanced thing understandable to the outside world. But like to me, ETH is a privacy coin. I mean, like there is pools, like I mean, ETH? there is like ETH. ETH is clearly privacy. Uh, so is USDC, by the way. Uh, like anything, because any like permissionless asset I can put into a contract on Ethereum that like provides me strong privacy guarantees. Like this like notion of privacy coins is really like a Bitcoin era thing where like assets were tied to fundamental state machines. And like this distinction is like, I mean, we can pretend it exists. It just doesn't exist in reality um, because these assets can flow across many different state machines. They can like flow across bridges to other systems that have different properties that they provide over these assets. Um, and so in Anoma, it's really like, it's not a system level choice. So Anoma is not a privacy chain. Anoma just happens to have the right primitives to allow developers to build useful privacy preserving applications that end users can then use. And the nice thing is you can even have like an intent that's privacy preserving and an intent that's transparent. And both of them can be meshed together. Like you, you aren't splitting your liquidity or you, you aren't splitting your state across private versus non-private, which I think is actually... But, but let's say... Let's say there's like something like a Uniswap or something like that. And now I want to trade with this 
uh, system and I have, you know, let's say I have ETH and I want USCC, then I can, Enoma allows me to do that in a private way. Um, if you built an app, I mean, that many caveats. Enoma is a sort of very fundamental base layer. Like if someone builds an application that allows you to do this, yes. Uh, with a one caveat. So it is a concern of the application developer that the person has to worry about that. So it is a concern of like, privacy comes with many nuances very quickly, which is like, if you want to trade A for B, you must tell someone about your desire to trade A for B. Uh, this is just always going to be true. Uh, you must reveal at least your state changes to someone. Uh, now with Anoma, you can sign an intent that says I'd like like that just like authorizes A for B privately, and you only reveal the fact that you're willing to do A for B to one specific solver. Um, this is generally true for like everything, and like you can structure and you can't do better than this. I mean, this is sort of a fundamental limitation. Even with FHE, you aren't going to go, you aren't going to do better than this. You could imagine that I I have one ETH. And I can basically say, hey, I can prove one ETH is willing to trade for, you know, USDC at this price. And someone can get that, you know, that intent without knowing whose ETH it is. Yes, this is exactly sort of the simple case of Anoma, of like how you would like as a user authorize a private intent. Um, but even there, I mean, you leak some data. So if you want to go like, you don't even want to leak that like there's an intent to trade A for B you'd have to like figure out only to which specific counterparties you want to reveal to your desire to trade A for B. And the other thing is, I think we always think of as like regulators don't like privacy, but the other thing, like, and I think it's because like Bitcoin started as this like counter government movement. Um, like I am much more concerned on the flip side, which is like, I want privacy for national defense. Um, like I like Switzerland, but I also have no illusions that the Swiss financial system is going to like be resilient against a like dedicated nation state attack. And like, so as a result, we're currently creating these like massive honeypots. Um, and like, I'm worried on like, how do I do local, like, how do we build infrastructure that allows us to do like national defense, community defense, where individual communities can actually run this infrastructure to be resilient against hostile actors. And like, this is much more the frame from which I'm thinking about privacy guarantees. It's not like I'm trying to hide something. It's more like, I'm really worried about North Korea, like getting access to all my financial data um, or like this, all the Swiss financial data. And so like, I want to build good infrastructure so the Swiss government can kind of run with it. Um, yeah, I don't, I think the crypto space is like doing itself a huge disservice here on like, and how the, we phrase a little bit like our pri desires for privacy. Um, because it's like, I trust my local community. I like my local community. Uh, I'm actually f really fine with it. Um, but, and like, I'm worried about how do we build systems that can help defend my local community. Um, because like, I think the fastest way to get Ethereum killed tomorrow is we move over the US financial system into Ethereum. And then like tomorrow the NSA will wake up and go, that's a terrible idea. North Korea is data mining the fuck out of our financial information. And then we're done here. Um, Right, like this is sort of like a very practical concern, which is, yeah, uh, I don't know. This, this is like my, it's privacy for national defense. I, I think we're not going to get away, especially in this multipolar world order, which we're going to go into right now. Um, you need to have resilient systems as individual entities in order for you to prosper and survive long term, I think. So you guys, um, so, you know, we've talked about Noma so far. Now, there is actually a chain that you guys are launching or that is being launched, uh, which is called Namada, which, uh, so can you, can you share like, what is a Namada and what's the relationship between Anoma and Namada? Yeah. So you can really think of Namada to be the crazy people in the Anoma community in the Anoma ecosystem that want to try privacy preserving guarantees really quickly in a simple fashion that's Namada and so Namada is a sovereign L1 um, or I guess we could frame it as an L2 I mean like the distinction between what is an L1 and what is an L2 is kind of it's very irrelevant and it's mostly mimetic at this point there's no technical reasonable technical distinction 
at like a distributed systems level for this. Um, but so Namada is just a subset of the Enoma community of people that really deeply care about privacy guarantees and that like want to try this out. And so what Namada does is um, it provides a multi-asset shielded pool or multi-asset shielded set. Um, so you can move any asset into it, um, including NFTs, um, and you get uniform privacy guarantees uh, for all of these assets. Um, and this is generally true. This is generally also true. This is not just assets. It's generally data. Um, like the fact that we ascribe meaning to these bits, like that we ascribe financial meaning to like these bits floating around in like some global state on Ethereum is really arbitrary. I mean, in the end, it's just data messages. So with Amari, you just get very good data protection guarantees for whatever data you want to have. I mean, your data could represent financial assets, could represent messages. You pick your choice kind of thing. So, so one, I mean, for example, one, one pl place where, for example, like, let's say me personally, or like, you, I mean, I think a lot of users will probably try to get some privacy on chain is let's say you have like, you know, some Ethereum wallets or some Ethereum accounts Now you want to buy, I don't know, an NFT somewhere. And then you want to, you don't want to have that in like, I don't know, your main wallet that's like linked with all your, I don't know, stable coins and other, you know, me, whatever you have in there. And then like, I mean, I guess the main way people do this today uh, is they basically are going to use a centralized exchange, right? They're going to say, hey, I'm going to create a new ETH address and then I send their uh, you know, maybe the ETH or stablecoin or something, and then I buy, uh, I buy the asset from there. Now, of course, in that case, you still have maybe Binance or Kraken or someone who will be able to connect these different addresses. But it's, it's like, for example, one of the use cases now for Namada that like I could do something like that. And like, let's say move ETH in there and then move ETH out of there to like a, a new wallet. And now somebody's not going to be able to link those two uh, wallets. I think that's a very possible use case. Um, so certainly right now, like Coinbase and Kraken and Binance are the single largest mixers in the world. Um, I mean, this is just like practically true at the moment. And we can talk. I mean, and the problem, the big problem is like, I think we really underestimate how useful, like, for example, like some of the um, sort of like KYC policies are Binance does are because especially in the age of generative AI, all of these things are just going to be toast. Um, like I think we really have to come up with a different model here anyway. But like generally speaking, they're the single largest mixers in the world. Um, and yes, most people use it like this. I did this earlier today. Um, I think this is one option, um, like something that the nomadic community could pursue is sort of, I mean, this is like what I would like to use it for, if I'm honest. I'm like, I would like to like buy this NFT. I don't want to have to link all my um, sort of like activity across all these chains. Uh, I think the other thing is also around, I would like to participate in governance votes, but on other systems, but without leaking all my data. And so like with Amada, you can also do something called shielded actions, which just gives you the ability to sort of remain uh, shielded uh, while also executing something, for example, on osmosis or participating in governance vote. Um, so like it just gives you this ability to not only for your trading, but also for like just your general other data to actually remain shielded at all times. Um, yeah, I, I think honestly, this is sort of like the nicest thing for Namada um, at the moment. I, I think we really want to see like where the community ends. Like I'm very curious on like where the community ends up taking it because like I, to this extent, like the community is launching the thing. Um, I have no idea. There are things happening on the forum. It may come up, come online at some point in the next couple of weeks from a forum post, it seems. Um, so I'd really like to see where so, uh, they're going to take it. The thing is, I think we really haven't tried this in practice a lot yet um, on how these systems can actually be utilized. And uh, yeah, I am very excited for it. What else do you think we should cover? I mean, we could talk about the collapse of the banking system. Uh, I find this quite curious. Uh, Let's do it. Let's do it. That sounds fun. So basic thesis here, um, which is, so every year we add more regulatory pressure to banks, right? 
And so every year, the marginal cost of an extra customer or of existing customers becomes higher. And at some point, and like these regulatory pressures generally never go away, right? Like the, it just keeps being added. And so like my bold case for crypto is that sort of like banks will start off banking normal people very soon. Like if you, ever, if you do like three transfers above 15K a year, your bank is going to ask questions, at least in Germany. Um, and so like at this point... What if you do three transfers above 15K? So, I mean, I have this very specific use case. Someone tried to send me money from Germany to Switzerland. Apparently, Switzerland is a high-risk jurisdiction. This caused an entire thing where uh, there was an entire day involved, three day, three people looking compliance. Because, like, it's an unusual amount. It's an unusual country. And so, like, my entire... So, like, my basic thesis is, like, these pressure points on banks keep going up and banks don't like them because it increases their cost of compliance. But it means that large parts of their customer base are just going to become unprofitable. Um, and so these people have nowhere else to go. Where do they go? Well, to this alternative financial system. And so like, I think, honestly, banking regulation, to some extent, is like the bull case for crypto because every new banking regulation just drives more customers to USDC. No, I mean, I think it's, it's obviously the case already, right? Like within crypto, let's say if you take the example of making investments in other projects right like you make an angel investment somewhere or you know like course one we invest in something i mean all of these payments are with stable coins right and it's just like nobody would use when to use a bank wire for it because it's just like so inferior and if you try to do it then you have some person calling you up and they want to like you know get the documentation and it's a bunch of hassle and it takes longer and it's more expensive and it's just so i i think that is like very very clear that there's a lot of a lot of advantage here for crypto. Yeah, and I, I think this will push a surprising amount of people into crypto very quickly, actually. I mean, like in the West, I think we have less the pressure points, but especially if you live like in uh, like middling developed countries, these pressure points are just going to keep increasing for you. Um, the other thing is I think also like neobanks are toast um, due to generative AI. Like I think like the first lot, like I think self-custody is going to become inevitable. Because at some point, someone is going to generate a hundred thousand, uh, like realistic looking generative AI videos to like recover Revolut account access and a bunch of accounts will be drained. And like, I, I don't see anyone proposing realistic solutions outside of self custody where you must own your own keys that you aren't then trained to give to scammers because like my passport data is clearly going to be in some leak somewhere like and it's not going to be difficult to generate like realistic looking videos um to like uh, re-kyc me with banks or exchanges and it, it, definitely not in five years from now and uh, the same is going to be true for like 90 percent of, of the listeners of epicenter i think like it's an actual risk we should be thinking about um it is i, I think very underappreciated and i think these two things are the probably the single largest driver in terms of like why what is crypto's use case um right now cool so uh timeline i think you mentioned namada is you know probably sometime soon and then imminent i think imminent um last check the forum it seems that the genesis transaction like pre-genesis transactions i think they were supposed to they're going to close end of next week or something like this um, oh, so, yeah, so by the time this comes out, may already be live. No, 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 and then like a couple of weeks, I think for the validators want to do a lot of testing. So probably shortly around the time this goes out. Yeah, and then we have Enoma, which is like sometime next year, probably. No, this is um, first private DevNet um, coming this year. Uh, so we'll start the Builders program this year. So keep a lookout for that, and then. Targeting public chest and starting early next year, and then mainly towards uh, sometime middle of next year. Yeah, it, it's super exciting on the Enoma front. It, it, it's going to be, I mean, like, it's the first time where like we're trying to propose something radically new, um, and it's going to be cool. And it's going to allow us to do new things that we couldn't do before. And like, I remember like when when Ethereum started becoming a thing, and I could do new things that I couldn't do on Bitcoin, and they became easier. And I think we're going to see a similar moment. Um, so I'm pretty bullish. 
I'm I'm very excited for that. I would love to you know try some new things and uh, see see some new some new types of use cases and capabilities enabled. So super excited to see that. Thanks so much, Adrian. Thank you very much.